Hello, everybody. We're in week 12. Uh, we have talks this week from Mona Papage on georeferencing, from me on data cleaning by hand and kind of some basic principles, and data cleaning from Tomer Guetta on um, automating the process and, and being able to do the process in larger scales. So we will jump into questions and see where this takes us over the next hour. So I'm going to share my screen and take you to, let's see, everybody can see my email. There we go. There's the course plan. We are in week 12. So those are the three talks we have now. But for next week, we have uh, filtering and autocorrelation um, from Matt Aiello, um, subsetting for evaluation from Jamie Cass, and data citation from Daniel Nosgaard. So uh, those will be online on Monday. Uh, and as of right now, we have with us John Wachorek, Marlon Kobos, Mona Papage, and Tomer Guetta. So everybody, here is the list of questions. And just let me know what you would like to uh, take on. Well, there are a lot of questions. <laughs> there are. Uh, I see you, you highlighted in yellow some. I, I did. Somebody did. Oh, okay. Mine is <laughs> We can John, start with those. you speaking, please get closer to a microphone. Okay. Is this any better? A little yes. bit better, but you might try screaming. <laughs> screaming? Okay. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Go ahead, Mona. Uh, we can start, I think at the top, the first one is uh, 1691. There you go, mm -hmm. 1691. I have a question regarding the uncertainty of geographic, of georeferenced occurrence data. What is the best way to deal with records that are spatially close to one another and with such a high uncertainty that they end up overlapping? Complicated one. <laughs> so, uh, uh, John, I mean, I, 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 I selected it. I guess I should try to answer it. Uh, but John, please chime in or anyone else. Um, um, so they are, if I understand well, these uh, occurrence data have high uncertainty. Uh, and they overlap because of that high uncertainty. Um, I would have to ask an additional question, which is what kind of uh, environmental data are you trying to use? So what's the resolution of your environmental data? Because if the resolution of the environmental data is, let's say, one kilometer and the uncertainty is, I don't know, 10, 50 kilometers, then you actually shouldn't be using any of those high uncertainty occurrences. So the overlap or part of the question becomes irrelevant if the um, environmental data or the model that you are trying to run is at resolu a resolution that is higher than the uncertainty of the occurrences. Um, now, if the uh, environmental resolution, environmental data resolution is lower the, than the uncertainty of these data points, I would say, pick one of the two. <laughs> uh, um, don't, obviously, don't, you don't need to use both of them because they will both be in one pixel and yeah, they will only be used once. I so think, I don't know, if, yeah. I think we can go a little more general as well and just say uh, it really depends on what you're going to use the data for. Uh, in many cases, and you'll hear about this as of Monday, in many cases, we downsample uh, regions that are, that are sampled overly densely. In some cases, such as in public health applications, where we may be dealing with you know, 
all known cases of some disease, uh, we may want to return, retain both of them because they may both um, represent independent derivations or independent transition, transmission events of a rare disease. So I think it really is context dependent on what do you want the occurrence data for? Yeah. If I may, the, the next one, the, the one below this one is actually quite quick and I think it's a good one. Uh, so 1692, if the uncertainty of your occurrence data is five kilometer and your climate data resolution is one kilometer, could, could, uh, could you, uh, could be a possible solution to change the climate data resolution to five kilometer. Uh, so I think that's a good alternative to, in, yeah, to being able to use those occurrence data that have a, an uncertainty of five kilometers, um, make your your environmental data course, coarser or change the resolution, make the resolution um, coarser from one kilometer to five kilometer. And while we're just going down the page, uh, if I want to make an actual niche model of a given species, but I have records from different years, let's say from 1997, 2002 and 2017, the correct thing would be to extract the information of a given year for each record and then model them with actual conditions. That's a really neat question. And later in the course, we're gonna have a presentation from Kate Ingenloff who has implemented exactly that, uh, taking into account sampling density, both across space and through time. So stay tuned for, uh, a solution to that challenge and in fact pretty detailed R code to be able to implement it. Um, Tomer, a question you'd like to answer? <clears throat> yeah, I marked a few of them. Let's go to um, yeah, 1702. There we go. Yeah, so. Okay, let me read it. Question for Tomer. Awesome talk. <laughs> I knew you wouldn't say that one. <laughs> I'm not quite sure if I understand the R code line about the snapshots. Could you please explain the function or the benefit of this? Yeah, what I explained in my talk was that one way of controlling your R environment is controlling the versions, the package version. That you're using. So the simplest way to make them fix is by using a specific snapshot of the crane repository. Uh, that means that you're just downloading the packages from a particular day and by that you are able to always downloading the same versions. So your entire R package environment is identical no matter when you are running your analysis, you're always able to recreate the, the same uh, package environment. Uh, so this is one way of, this is like maybe the low, the, the simplest way of achieving it, the, the more sophisticated way of doing it today. Uh, and we're gonna have a talk later in the course from uh, two researchers from the, um, Brazilian um, National Laboratory for, for um, High Performance Computing, um, where they'll be talking about kind of full replicability of kind of any, any science application. It's a pretty interesting talk. Cool. Um, additional questions can be, uh, let's see. Yeah, seventeen zero six. Seventeen zero six, right there. Yeah, right there. So the student is asking, basically trying to understand what is the difference between BD checks and BD clean, and 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 he understood what is BD Darwin core, but uh, BD checks is not that clear to him. Uh, the idea is that. While BD, like BD checks, it should be like a supermarket of ingredients, meaning there should be tons of different data checks 
So you go to the supermarket to be organized in a specific way. You will choose your ingredient. You will understand, you will have a complete uh, understanding of, it compo of, of, it in, of what it contains. And then you were able to create your own recipe with this variety of, of, of uh, food source. But you have like a, a, a very standardized way to, to, uh, to know exactly what you use and everyone else is uh, seeing your recipe can, can recreate it very easily. While BT Clean is more like a, like, a, like a fast food restaurant, you are able to get, we are able to give you uh, like some modification, but it's much quicker. It's not that, uh, it's not a gourmet food. It will be like a easy, uh, easy uh, workflow to, to clean your data, something that is more, uh, we're unable to understand all the different limits of your research, but we can give you something that is very uh, value for effort. It's quite good. But if you need something that is much more, uh, elaborate, then you have the entire uh, BD checks to your disposal. And the idea of BD checks is that BD checks is like the heart of the system. The more checks we were able to have, the different types, different kinds, the more other officials can use them and then be more sophisticated and be more, and we can incorporate them in dashboards and in other stuff uh, that we are doing. So like BD checks in some ways, like the heart of the system and how can we make it like extremely easy to, to one hand to perform, but in, in other hand to develop and maintain. This is the this is the hard part that John is. Uh, without John, I don't know what we were able to do. Like we build BD checks based on on the on the standardized uh, data quality checks. Uh, this is like the basis of how we can able to to even address this. But yeah. Okay. Um, Mona, another question you'd like to take on? Um, well, the one right above, <laughs> uh, 1705. And maybe John can answer this one. I don't want to um, take over the entire um, uh, session, but yeah, this is a, this, this question um, is about what it says. I have um, about 2000 uh, records points, but only 441 have an uncertainty from 0.2 meters to, I don't know how many zeros are there, but probably, uh, I don't know, 10,000 kilometers. square kilometer. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't, I couldn't see what that is. Uh, I will work with work limb arc, uh, 30 arc seconds. Can the data below this value uh, be used? Um, so in this case, the, the big question, I mean, the big problem is that only four, 541 occurrences have uncertainty out of 2000 occurrences. So if the other occurrences don't have uncertainty, um, John would recommend you georeference <laughs> the uh, 19,459. <laughs> Uh, which is a lot of a lot of uncertainty uh, to calculate. Um, so the I think the 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 answer the the straightforward answer would be well uh, you need to to assign uncertainty to the rest of your of the occurrences. Um, that would be the best practice. But uh, we know that a lot of the papers we read don't even mention uncertainty so it's yeah i mean best practice would be to have uncertainty for all of your occurrence data i have a question i highlighted a lot of them that are just like this one and some of them are a little bit more explicit what people seem to want to know is what exactly do i need to do to match my occurrence uncertainty environmental so, John, we can barely hear you. I know what you okay, just I'm said. Yelling. <laughs> you know, I know what you just said is people want to know how to match their occurrence data and associated uncertainty values with environmental data sets. They want to know exactly how. <laughs> and it's not simple. I have questions myself. I have no idea how you do this because the point falls somewhere in a picture. But that uncertainty 
overlap. John, we can barely hear you. Sorry. I'm yelling. I'll go get headphones. Okay. Let, let me let me jump into this while John gets his headphones. Um, there, there's some basic geometry that you need to think about. Here in this question, the the uh, uncertainty in meters is uh, is given as well. A thousand meters would be one kilometer. So this is actually a thousand kilometers. Now the question is which which cutoff would you use to work with world clim thirty arc seconds? Well, you know, neglecting projection differences and the declining size of a thirty arc second grid square with latitude. Remember that using one kilometer as your uncertainty criterion only assures that you will be in the correct pixel or an adjacent pixel. Okay? It does not assure that you will be in the correct pixel. But given spatial autocorrelation in environments, that may not matter very much. Now, Mona and John are kind of absolute about, well, you have to um, georeference with full metadata the remaining 19,400 and how much any, how many did you say, Mona? 59 points? Apparently, yes. <laughs> um, I would say I would want to look at the 541 points and see how good a job they do. The existence of 20,000 occurrence points or 20 million occurrence points does not chain you to having to, un to, to georeference them all. You need enough yeah. points to characterize the phenomenon of interest, not all the points. That's, yeah, that's true. You don't need, if, if you have 2,000 occurrences for one species, uh, that's, <laughs> that's not needed uh, unless, I don't know, uh, unless I, I can think, I guess if it's a global species, but, um, yeah, I mean, if it's if it's a few, if it if it is a, just a few taxa and you have two thousand occurrences, maybe uh, prioritize which occurrences absolutely need to be included because the part a particular uh, species or taxon has just a handful of of occurrence points. And usually, that's you know, when I give my students the bad news about georeferencing, I I tell them, you know, you don't. Okay, I understand that you don't want to spend the next six months georeferencing 4,000 occurrences or 10,000 occurrences, but uh, prioritize which species have are the uh, most data poor, and then concentrate your georeferencing uh, on those on those species that are not well represented in the georeferenced uh, piece of the GBIF data or Bison data that you downloaded. So, yeah, you're right. I mean it. it the answer is not go ahead, down georeference 19,000. <laughs> well, and, and we can be way more practical. We could start with those 19,459 points <laughs> and right away throw away everything that doesn't have a specific locality designation. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, so maybe that comes down to 16,000. And then we may know that we have wonderful sampling for uh, Western Europe and, and East Asia, but have almost nothing from areas within the range of the species in Central Asia. So you might want to then take only those Central Asian countries and georeference the 200 points from those countries. And who cares about the thousands of points from the regions where you already have good sampling? So yeah. it's not a big, as big a job as you think it is. Now, the other side of the coin is, I would love to see the community, and especially the data provider community, take on the challenge of georeferencing everything so that we don't have to do this over and over again. And John has been a, a, a super important leader in, uh, in that challenge as part of the, the VertNet. Uh, initiative. John, are you back with us now? I am. Does this work? Way yeah, better. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, so many things to say. This question is fabulous <laughs> because there's a ton of stuff hidden in it. Yes. 
there's what you just talked about while I was running to get my headphones. I don't know if you talked about the other things that are of interest to me in this question. Go ahead, go ahead. The range of uncertainties mentioned here is from very from ridiculously precise, like unrealistically precise, to uh, looks like maybe a thousand kilometers. And when I <clears throat> when I left, I was saying that there are many other questions related to this, where people want to know exactly how to match scales between occurrences and the pixel size. And here it specifically mentions world claim at thirty arc seconds. So we've got all kinds of problems here that if you think deeply enough, people are gonna wonder about, like 30 arc seconds. It's not a kilometer. It's not a kilometer and it's not the same everywhere on the planet, which means all these uh, models are being based on not equal distance projections, first of all. Second of all, the uncertainties are based on a distance and that distance is a radius and the radius is of a circle. And so how do you match scales between something that's a circle and something that's a grid of varying size? So I mentioned in my talk a way to do that by what's the area of a pixel versus what's the area of the uncertainty, but nobody challenged me and we didn't discuss it and I'm not a niche modeler. So somebody should be questioning that statement. And if that statement is a good one, even so, if you match the areas, the, the circle of the uncertainty is going to intersect multiple pixels. So then what? What is, in detail, what are the effects of all these things on the modeling? Or do they ultimately not really matter? Well, I, I think where it, where it matters is where there's a very, very fine spatial lag to the environmental data. If you were here in the Great Plains where I'm sitting and Marlon is sitting, it kind of doesn't matter if you're off by a few kilometers because the environments don't change. But look at where Tomer is. Look in the background <laughs> of, his, of his view, or actually where John is also. If you're off by a, a kilometer, it makes a huge difference as far as the environments go. But I mean, I guess I'd, I'd want to make a more general comment, which is that niche modeling got easy thanks to efforts by people like Stephen Phillips, uh, who developed really easy platforms for doing this work. And, you know, in my career, I've seen this kind of phenomenon happen twice before multivariate statistics. You know, the first paper I ever published, we did the regressions by hand, literally with pencil and paper. And now you can do them in a second. And then phylogenetics. You know, was it, when I went, was in graduate school, we would put the, the synapomorphies on trees by hand. And I know this sounds like, you know, the old gray haired guy ranting, but what I'm saying is when you make processes easy, then people do them quickly without doing all of the careful, careful thinking that we probably did more before it was easy because we had to. So yeah, I mean, we should be uh, if we're working in a system with any latitudinal breadth, we should be projecting our, um, our environmental data and working with equal area pixels. And that means that your uncertainty circles will oftentimes be, be squashed, they'll be oval. And you get into all of these crazy, difficult challenges of how do I georeference effectively? How do I clean my data? How do I clean my data with an eye to the use to which I want to put my data? I need to make my data fit, in this, fit for a particular use. And a use for a global model versus a use for a, a local model, or as Mona mentioned, with you know, climate data versus remotely sensed data, those are massively different challenges. 
if I would, um, I, I always look at it like, at least for data cleaning, like the, the two main things to capture, one is, is the value for effort aspect of cleaning. It's really important. And the second one is really understanding your needs. And it, it's for most people, it sounds trivial, but it's so not trivial. Understanding really properly understanding your needs. In some way, it's, it's really important to do like a reverse engineering exercise. Like, and like and analyze your ideal uh, the analysis need mm -hmm. and then derive all the, the needs that you need and then evaluate the gaps of what you have. This might give you like, uh, like really give it uh, the, the, the necessary place to do it. And as what you said, when tools are becoming so easy, I think it's really important for us when we are developing tools is to develop like an entire environment. Like what Wallace people are doing, it's like, it's, it's, it makes easy for a lot of aspects, but if you build the environment from a user perspective, you really can, can guide him through and you can really enforce a, a good practice and methodology by just by, by building it. Uh, it's like the, the, it's something that it's like the art of, of tool development. You can really invest uh, guiding your, your user, guiding it. It's maybe, it's not just all about the, the analysis. Mm -hmm. Also by giving the like good methodology is not by giving you answers, but giving you good guidelines. And how can we implement that? Yeah. As an example of what Tomer just said, I'll put a paper on the course page. It's it was led by uh, Mariana Simoes. Uh, but it was really interesting because she was working with this this genus of beetles, mainly in South America, a little bit in the Caribbean. Um, and as she worked through literally visiting every collection and looking at every specimen of this genus, she realized that cleaning the data wasn't just a matter of finding the errors, but rather of understanding the sources of the errors. And it was really neat because she realized that there were, there were errors in the data that were kind of mechanical georeferencing errors. And you can imagine that, you know, you have some, some distribution of the species and those errors could take a point and artificially move it somewhere else. But other errors were ones of misidentification. Correctly georeferenced, just incorrectly identified. And so she asked the question of, what are the effects on niche models of those two sources of errors? And it's really interesting because the ones that are identification errors, providing that niches are relatively conser conserved in the group that you're looking at, the identification errors don't cause major problems because you, you basically are are picking up a biological analog of the, the thing that you're trying to study. Whereas the random errors create serious problems for your, um, for your, your models because it can place a point qualitatively outside of the envelope of your species. Anyhow, I'll put that up for everybody to look at. I guess, I guess that will also have to do with the algorithm you're using. Yes. Because if it is a like machine learning algorithm, the errors may be more problematic if you're using a more complex model. Yeah, and, and we're gonna talk about the concept of E, the kind of maximum acceptable error. That's a capital italicized E, not the uh, bold E that we use probably inadvisedly to refer to environmental space. Um, but this is a, a concept that Mona was part of, of tossing out into the, the literature. But it's essentially, you know, we're, here we're talking about like filtering and throwing out data when the data are too uncertain or too 
um, too problematic. Uh, there's also the recognition that sometimes we just have to accept that we have error in our data and build into our analyses uh, the idea of taking into account that, that error and building analyses using algorithms that are not overly affected or not as much affected by that error. So we'll talk about that later on in the course. Who's got a question you want to answer? These are, this is great, by the way. Well, there's an interesting one, uh, uh, 1713, 1713 line, um, okay, that I, I have not heard. You can read it down, sorry. No, it's okay. I have read in some works that another method to check that the coordinates are correct is to check the elevation of the record against the real one. Would you recommend this method? And I have not heard about this method. <laughs> um, it, it's a, it comes back into the consistency ideas that I threw out, where you have an elevation given on the, in the data record, and you have an elevation that corresponds to the coordinates. Now those two elevations will not be exactly identical. There's error in the DEMs that you use to relate to the coordinates. And there's certainly error in the measurement of the elevation in the field or by whatever means that elevation came to be. And I bet you the metadata about where it came from uh, don't exist. So, you know, both have error, but you could very certainly take all of your records for which you have an elevation and create a regression line and you would expect that regression line to line up right around uh, a slope of 1.0. And then a good way to find errors might be to look for the, the points that fall far from that one-to-one -one regression line. Okay. Yeah. There was a paper by Rebecca Rowe as well, 2005, if I'm not mistaken, about what happens um, in terms of uh, elevational gradients using data from Manus that were georeferenced with uh, taking into account the elevational data. So that might be an interesting one to look at. I can find that reference and send it on to town to add to the course. Yes, this. please do. <clears throat> really super and early use of georeference data to look at these kinds of issues. Yeah, if you send that to me, I'll put it online right away. Okay, I'll look now. Um, while I'm at it though, I have just sent you, Town, the references that will help a lot of people get their answers, ones I've highlighted in yellow here, that are the references to the um, the georeferencing best practices, the georeferencing quick reference guide, and the georeferencing calculator and its manual, all of which are going into public review from GBIF as soon as they can get the documents up to date. So if you add those to the course list, people can go and actually read and get answers to almost all of the georeferencing questions that are here. Okay, I, I will do the elevation one. Are those not online quite yet? They are online. All the DOIs are live. The okay. documents there are not with all the images and stuff yet. So GBIF right now is, turn, is formatting them into ASCII docs as we speak. But, you know, you know as a, a placeholder, you can look at what's there now. What's there now is not wrong. It's just not complete yet. Okay. I will put those up. Thank you. Okay, I'll go look for Rebecca's paper. <laughs> I have a question. Question, anybody? Yeah. Can we look at 1700? And this question may sound repetitive, but um, I just want to highlight something. If 
everybody that listened to this talks also uh, was paying attention during the like talks about variables and environmental layer sources and all that and how they are created. Uh, I think we should be aware that we need to add all these sources of uncertainty and think really that if you're trying to create a model at 30 arc second resolution, then your data needs to be very good because not only your data matters, the uncertainty in your data matters, but also remember that these layers at that resolution, they are the product of downscaling. And we already talked about the problems of downscaling, especially in certain areas where uh, meteorological data is not available. So uh, if you don't have good records that allow you to construct models at certain resolution, just change the resolution, make it coarser. And that doesn't mean your models are going to be bad. They may not look that pretty in terms of resolution and the lines you want to see, but it's better to have a model that is simpler than a model that is more complex and more run. Yes. Other questions? Well, if no one, <laughs> no one has one uh, or burning one, and this is not burning either, but it's interesting. So. Uh, line 1722, it says, thank you for all the uh, talks about georeferencing. Is there an R script that talks with the georeferencing calculator, for example, to create a loop with records to be investigated? Uh, in the case of identification of uncertainty, in your opinion, what is the best way? One, eliminate the record of the analysis, which is a problem for rare species or two, use predictor variables with a coarser resolution. So two, we already, I think we already discussed two. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in that, this idea of, which I have no, no way of answering, <laughs> Marlon. <laughs> Marlon and other people can, may, may uh, wanna answer this, but um, this idea of having an R script that talks with the georeferencing calculator seems interesting to me. Um, I don't think that exists, but I might be wrong. That does not exist any longer. There used to be a thing called Biogeomancer, and it was magical, and it died. <laughs> I want to that, resurrect that was, it. That was indeed magical. I was part of the training uh, when, when Biogeomancer was, was launching uh, a long, well, <laughs> feels like a long time ago for me, but, uh, but yeah, that would be great. Yeah, it died because of an infrastructure meltdown and a lack of institutional support thereafter. The code all exists. I want to resurrect it. I have plans and business models and all kinds of things to do so. And people helping me to build parts of it with funding, but it doesn't exist anymore. The calculator itself is just a JavaScript web-based calculator. And so it doesn't have an API, it doesn't have anything that it can talk, it can talk with it. The closest we have to such a creature is the API for geolocate, which you can invoke even from OpenRefine to try to get georeferences out of geolocate. Whether there's one for R as well, I don't know. That would be interesting to know. But Mona already talked about some of the caveats about the use of geolocate, especially outside the US and especially for non-fish-based records. Um, it works, but it's hard to know when it doesn't. So careful. This, this, is, this highlights a, a problem. I know John is intensely aware of this, but you know, we, we do these, these projects and we write proposals that basically say, you know, we're gonna do this and this and this and this and this. And funding agencies, get excited about what we promise we'll do, but they don't always, or they frequently don't get the idea that communities come to rely on these tools. And so there's, 
very little interest from most funding agencies in beyond that initial development, how do you keep it going? And so, you know, John led the the, the Vertnet project. I, you know, I was a satellite in that in that galaxy. Um, wonderful project enabled what thirty some million vertebrate specimen records across North America, John, something like that. No, they were all across the world. Um, we ultimately, between the three terrestrial projects, there were five million locations georeferenced. Yeah, and and those were those were things that became kind of bread and butter tools for the community. And yet, National Science Foundation here in the U.S. basically said, "Well, we funded the development. That's what we do." And there's, I, I consider it a real problem in kind of our our science infrastructure that we don't then say, well, this is a tool that's being used as, you know, bread and butter for our community, and there's no way to maintain the tool. Now, VertNet is held together. Uh, Biogeomancer fell apart. And, you know, I, I don't know what led to each of those events, but, uh it's it's just a comment that you know everybody out there remember when you propose developing something that's exciting remember the dimension of how will you maintain it a day a month a year or a decade after your funding runs out yes biomancer Biogeomancer died and wasn't rebuilt because vertnet was in the process of being built and there weren't resources to do both then VertNet continued to live on the auspices of people's free time to keep it running. And Biogeomancer still doesn't get any airtime because that commitment is in place. It's like, you can only do so much with your 24 hours a day. <laughs> yep, yep. Especially when it's all free. Yep. Donated, yeah. volunteer. The only Palmer, thing. Go ahead. I, I it, it's a, uh, it's a, I would say it's a vulnerable point in the sense that the sustainability of tool development in scientific work is the, maybe the highest, uh, the holy grail. Uh, and I think the R community has a really good example of how you can build an entire community that's able to maintain uh, a lot of the packages. Uh, and what is the most important to me in the biodiversity development is not the features. It's the maintainability of stuff. Uh, that's why we are like, we are building it based on Google Summer of Code. So we are building like a, an infrastructure of, of, of generations that, that, that are able to, to help us develop it and support more and more people are able to help us in that way. Uh, like we are preparing for the worst uh, case, let's say a world pandemic. Uh, so, that, like having a long-term funding is um, is great, but it will just will allow us to develop new features as long as they are able to be self-sustained. This is like I'm not like now. I'm just dealing with what we have, how we can make it. Like unless I can see a, a constant proof that this is maintainable and enough people adopting it, so it can self-sustain and there are enough key. Or, player in the game for it, then we can invest more in, in, in making it like the vision we, we know it can be. Um, so there, there is hope for that. And I think today, like software sustainability is, 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 is discussed. It's, uh, it's like, a, yeah, so. The, the R community is really interesting. As you say, kind of most R packages or at least most of the ones that are being used actively are maintained, and it's not necessarily by the group that developed them. Now, yeah. another example that's relevant to niche modeling is that of um, QGIS, which mm -hmm. like R is a, a, a community software platform. Um, and I think that's one where, where 
tools tend to blink on and blink off much more um, unpredictably, or much less predictably, I should say. Uh, looks like we just lost John on that note. Um, but, you know, th those, that's an interesting experiment where, you know, imagine you put a really useful um, software item out there in R or in QGIS or in ARC, let's say, a commercial platform. Mm -hmm. And let's say you had, you know, each of those three platforms seeing equal amounts of use. Which one would last longest? Probably R. Yeah. And it, it's interesting, but probably the one that would become unusable fast and fastest is the one for ARC. Yeah. I just I just want to add something there. Uh, first of all, there is no magical tool that allows you to do this correctly, completely. Okay. Um, I I am. I am an R coder and I like coding in R and I like developing tools, but there are tools that cannot be developed completely. You have to understand that limitation. There is a function in R that can take locality description and give you a like longitude and latitude reference uh, coordinate, but uh, it's not perfect. It's in the package Dismo, and the name is Geocode, and it uses Google uh, references to to find the coordinate. Uh, but it does not give it. you the the metadata, correct? Exactly. You have to give the description of the locality. So you can use it, but be aware that if you just say that in the paper, there's going to be a reviewer, a reviewer like like me that is going to say. Uh, no, that 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 is not good. You have to check it. You have to double check every locality once it's georeferenced by a software. And if they are too many, of course, that's going to help. But the other thing is that most of the time, I I didn't even have results from Google from this function. So I don't know how good was BioGeomancer. That's the name, right? Yes. But Take into account that every country is different. Locality description may change depending on the country and depending how the names of the administrative and regions are, are managed. And there are countries like mine where the, a locality can be, the, the same name for a locality can be in five or six or more different places. So, so Biogeomancer took into account a lot of those points, which is to say it was built on global uh, occurren uh, gazetteer databases. And if there were multiple hits, you know, let's say Santa Maria, you know, in, in Ecuador or in Mexico or something like that, then it would give you the whole set of, of hits. And it was up to the intelligent and responsible user to go in and say, oh, I know it's this one, or I suspect it's this one. Um, and the real advantage of BioGeomancer is that it, um, it was integrated with the, the georeferencing calculator in that it provided the full set of metadata fields. Uh, and also it had facilities for batch, which I assume the, the Dismo code does. So you could you could put in a whole table of uh, of input data and get out a very nice workable data set um, that you could then spend days to or weeks or months cleaning up. But you'd get this initial pass of sorry of georeferencing uh, done automatically. So mm -hmm. I I do hope that John resurrects it because it's the sort of thing that you could imagine taking very large data sets and using BioGeomancer or whatever its descendant will be called to do a first pass and then go in and do careful work. Um, you know, this is, I, I, I think an important point is that we do this georeferencing in two senses. One is the sense of 
I'm doing a niche model for species X. As one of our questions asked, you know, I have 20,000 records and 19,500 of them are not georeferenced. So, you know, what do I do? And so that's one where you're an individual researcher and you are basically looking to get enough occurrence data to be able to do your study effectively and meet your study's goals. Now, a very different reason why you would do georeferencing is if, let's say, you're a curator of a museum collection or you are the, you're taking care of a, an observational data set, or if you were a data portal. And I think in that sense, you would want to take on the challenge of georeferencing everything, not just the things that you need. And you could move the whole, you know, 20,000 records or 20 million or 20 billion records to a common level of georeferencing, obviously with all the quality flags and metadata flags involved, but I think that's a very, very important challenge and really, you know, at risk of getting somebody angry at me, um, only VertNet has taken on that challenge and VertNet took it on only as far as NSF was willing to, to fund it. Uh, so for example, when we had the Ornus network, um, NSF said, no, 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 not going global. We'll fund only the georeferencing for United States localities. So anyhow, I would love to see, let's just you know, take a, an example out of our hat, GBIF, take on the role of coordinating and enabling georeferencing all ungeo-referenced data records in GBIF. It's a huge task, yes. It's also a doable task. And also, GBIF has precisely the global network that could make that happen pretty efficiently and effectively. Imagine, as John used to do with VertNet, imagine taking the GBIF records and splitting them up into work packages, maybe by country. And then GBIF's global network of country partners could check out a work package. Let's say the, the Beninese would say, well, we want to georeference all the data records that pertain to Benin. And they go in and do that, and then return the data package with all those, those georeferences and metadata uh, added. Love it. I volunteer. <laughs> I don't know why, again, with the exception of VertNet, none of the, uh, the data aggregators has ever taken on that challenge. Most they don't understand your referencing. Well, it's a lot of work, but, but you know, you could, a, a, an aggregator with an eye to enabling science might want to take that on. I'm yes. afraid I've got to run and teach another class. Run meaning run to get more hot water for tea, <laughs> run back here and sit my butt on my couch again and, and sit in on another Zoom meeting. Uh, any last comments from anybody? Okay, well, everybody, uh, thank you for your time this morning or afternoon as, as your time zone dictates. And everybody stay safe and stay healthy and uh, hope to see you again next week. Bye. Thank you, Tom. Bye. 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 Thanks a lot.